I'm Todd Kearns from Slash featuring Miles Kenny and the Conspirators, Took, Age of Electric, the Bruce Kulick Band, any number of things you might know me from. And you're watching Agent Royale all on YouTube. Just by doing it yourself. Screw everybody else. Okay, yeah, I got that for sure. So that's how the interview's gonna start. Okay, screw everybody else. Screw everybody else! That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Get a shot here. Okay, we're at the back of the bus with the Todd Kurtz. That sounds like a terrible. Uh... <laughs> we got uh, this is our second interview. Mm -hmm. It's been since the, the world on fire. It's like I'm going for a manager position. At, it's my second interview. Mm -hmm. Hoping I do well. From, uh, I'd like yeah. to start with my weaknesses, my strengths, with some of my weaknesses. I work too much. I care too much. I'll go ahead. Anyway. <laughs> okay, from world on fire to uh, living the dream. Yes. Has it been a dream? Uh, in a sure state, of, in a sure state of delirium, yeah. <laughs> um, it has been really fascinating because it's to me, and I've been I've been sort of saying this on the Living the Dream tour, has been a lot more of me kind of like really trying to take a step back and just take in what I can in a funny way because this all goes so fast, you know. I mean, I still was talking about how like back in the Age of Electric days, you know, we just went hard for nine, ten years doing that and then just stopped. And after the fact, I was kind of like, I wish I had taken more time to sort of just, you know, take it in, you know, yeah. and really kind of, you know, look around and really just enjoy that. So I've been trying to do that a lot more. It's hard, it's still hard to do because you hit the ground running and you just slam into this, this whole experience. But, um, you know, because we, in this particular band, which is almost a band slash project in a way because yeah. everybody has all these other things going on. So it's kind of like when everything lines up, we go, let's make a record, let's go on the road, you know, and we do that. But it always has this sort of end in sight. And it's quite old. extensive tours, though. Like, there are very extensive on. tours. In fact, this year we, 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 you know, people are like, you're not really touring all that long. And it's kind of like, well, we, we hit every market in a much shorter amount of time than we normally do, like which everywhere. actually makes it even harder because, right. you know, we, yeah. we, you know, go to South America. We used to, you know, hit a market, go home for a bit, and then go out another market. And this one is like, hit this market and just keep going and running around. And it's, um, it's, it's really hard to complain about it because it's such a pleasure. Yeah. You know, you get to go around the world and see some great. This particular tour, getting to see the Montreux Jazz Festival, getting to go to Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. We're doing. Did you have time in those places? To yeah, Jerusalem. Around. We walked around and it was really, really mind blowing. You know, to get to see some of that stuff. And we get to do the Ryman Theater in Nashville for the first time, and right away, and so that kind of stuff is, you know, it's it's not lost on me. I'm I'm always sort of, uh, um, you know, you have to stop and go, wow. If, if I had never picked up a guitar, I might never see any of this stuff. You know, I'd probably yeah. be working at a plant. <laughs> it's never too late to work at the plant, by the way. Never, never too late. Nine to five. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, describe the band in three words. Um, it's funny. I'm trying to think of the three words because it, it isn't until it isn't until living the dream that that somebody said you know we really have developed a sound and I thought that is interesting to say because an apocalyptic um, to world on fire to living the dream it's the slash riffs it's you know the band and then it's Miles' voice clearly but it's my voice with Miles on the harmonies. Yeah. And it creates this whole thing that is very specific to this band. Now, the changing the producers, does that do anything to change the sound? I don't know if it changed the sound. I think it might have changed um, aspects of it, or maybe like more of a, um, the direction of that sound. But I think there's sort of like, this is what we sound like. So this is what we sound like in this direction, but it's still the same band going in that direction. So I don't think it changes too much. But three words to describe it? I, I think relentless is a good word. Um, yeah. It, you know, uh, I think it's, uh, I think melody is a big word, and I think probably uh, riff. Let's just say riff. riff. The riff, I think, the is riff. slash the riff. Riff driven. Riff, yeah, it's yeah. it's definitely like Loud. all the songs are built off of some riff that Slash comes up with, and every riff he comes up with is like, is a classic riff. Like, yeah. you go, wow, that sounds like Slash, you know, and it is. So, who's the, uh, the biggest diva in the band? <laughs> The biggest, you know, what's funny is no one's really that diva-ish. Of course, mind you, I'm probably saying that, and then like as the guy you can't think of who is a diva, I'm probably the diva. I guess I don't know. Um, 
I think everybody has, you know, I think like anything else, a tour can be exhausting, and eventually you kind of have those moments of like, you know, can't we just get like another hour sleep or you know whatever it is? Yeah. Or, but um, in, no in, crazy writers. No, no. In reality, it's all very uh, chill. We 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 like to give uh, Miles a wide berth as far as like, you know, he takes really good care of himself, takes really good care of his voice. So we try to give him his space. And oddly enough, on this tour, I think more than ever, he is less needing of that space in a funny way. Like he's sort of been doing this for so long that he's kind of come to a place where he's kind of almost comfortable with, um, you know, like he's just always at battle. You know what I mean? He, he's sort of like, he sort of only arrived at the idea that he actually doesn't really, he has a home, but his home is on the road. You know what I mean? Yeah. He wrote great lyrics for a song on, on, I've lost track of the, of the album now, but "We Will Roam" is one of his songs that was all about living on the road. And every time we, you know, because you you record a song, and, and if you're not, if you didn't write the lyrics, you really don't think much about it. But um, later on, we would perform that song live, and it really hit me like, wow, you know, um, I can't quote any of them now, but it was really one of those things where I was like, wow, it's a really interesting thing because Miles is one of those people. It's like Alter Bridge, SNKC, Alter Bridge, SNKC, solo album. Like he's kind of constantly yeah. working. And um, I think that's, you know, it's important because I look at Miles and I look at Slash and I've really learned a lot about, you know, just really grabbing a hold of the momentum and just running with it, you know. And I mean, people always say that to me. They always say, you are so busy all the time. And I go, I am, but I'm also not good at downtime in the same way that Slash and Miles are. Like, I'm just, I like to be busy. I like to be doing something. Well, since you're most of the time on stage uh, around the world, what is the worst thing that's actually happened to you on stage? Oh, I've fallen multiple times on stage. That's about the worst of it. In South America recently, for the first time ever, I was a little bit food poisoning. Like, uh, when I say a little bit, it's because um, I have been to South America multiple times now, and I've seen people get laid out by, yeah. you know, by the... Now, are you vegan or vegetarian? I, I'm, I always call myself vegetarian because on the road it becomes a lot more sort of... Um, less restrictive because I, yeah. it, I it's you know I get into foreign countries and it's impossible to ask for this and that so I do my best um, but it, I, so much of it is water based when it comes to like you know poison, yeah. food poisoning and whatnot. ice cubes yeah ice cubes or, or like stuff on fruit or, ve or, or or vegetables like like salad has you know like they've been washed and whatnot yeah. so you have to really be careful and, and I've always prided myself on being able to go to India go to you know uh, we went to Beirut we went to all these different places and, but especially South America, you know, Mexico, where you, there's this discussion about getting food poisoning. And, and, but then again, that can happen anywhere. You can get something yeah. funky. And uh, so I got a little bit sick in, uh, in uh, Colombia or something like that. And it was like, but that could have been anything. It could have been a flu. I don't know. But uh, so I, ultimately, I, but I've been on stage in, in, you know, with crazy fevers and, and all kinds of like things like that. And, you know, your chest cold and this and that. performance. Yeah, you know, they call it stage health. It's sort of that thing of like, where you just want to die and all of a sudden it's like, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> you just when you walk on stage and you're like, yeah. you feel okay, you know, you, you survive for two hours and then you walk off and you want to die again. But, you know, other than that, I like I say, I've fallen a number of times. I've had all those kind of things happen. But other than that, it's, you know, I, you know, I grew up in, in playing clubs and people throwing stuff at us and heckling us and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's, when, you, when you really want to talk about the worst things that happen on stage, it's ducking bottles like this, <laughs> but that's a long time ago. Doesn't happen so much anymore. You know? <laughs> They're really far now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You just have to kind of yeah. see it coming. Heads up. What's your uh, favorite piece of clothing to wear on stage? Favorite piece of clothing? Um, I'm not really too religious about it. It's funny because um, the because uh, <laughs> we'll be playing like a hot festival and and I'll put a jacket on to go on stage and slash it. You're gonna wear a jacket? And I go. Joey Ramone wore a jacket. You know, the Ramones wore jackets when they went on stage. It would be weird to see the Ramones not wearing jackets. We played this festival in uh, in uh, Australia, uh, and it was like, you know, Vegas hot, like summer crazy, crazy hot. And uh, I remember thinking, like, ah, the hell with it. I'm just going to wear, you know, sleeveless shirt, go up there and rock out. So I jump up there and I rock out and I walk off stage. And it was still crazy hot. Like you're like, oh my god! And I walked off stage, and Slipknot was on right after us. And I walk up, and I don't know his name. That guy with the mask is skipping rope in a full 
boiler suit, black boiler suit with the mask on, getting ready for the show. And I thought, that's wow. Kind of I was like, <laughs> wow, I am a giant baby because these guys are like, and they were all walking towards the stage as we went down the stairs. The rest of the band's walking towards the stage and they're in all their gear. And it was like, they went up into the show in that heat with fire and all that stuff in the full costumes. And I thought, well, there you go. There's the commitment. So I, I, when you say a, a particular piece of clothing, I'm not really religious about it. It's, it's, I used to be a lot, when I was younger, I used to be a lot more particular about, I have to have this and I have to have that. And I've, over the years, I've learned to be a lot more like, it's almost better when you just kind of roll with it. You know, you kind of like, if you're not putting too much thought into things, you just go, here's a shirt, boom. Here's a jacket, go on stage, now, play. Would you wear the same thing, say, on, uh, on the street as you were, would on stage? Or is it, does it that change? Generally these days, I, I, I don't, we always laugh because it's like I'm gonna take these black pants off and put those black pants on and take this black shirt off and put on that black shirt and this black jacket you know it's just kind of like you're it's a different version of yourself you know yeah. it's kind of like there are certain things I don't wear on the street only because um, you know I just I have things that I wear on stage that I just want to sort of maintain for the stage if I wear it as my day-to-day -day clothes it just gets all trashed mind you the stuff that we wear on stage I, I don't know what those guys but my stuff just gets by the end of a tour it's just ruined from just Full contact rock and roll, which is a good thing. So what's the, what's the plan after the uh, tour? Um, well, there's a bunch of Took activity. Uh, Took is the Canadian band Fitz and I and Corey Churgo have. Um, so we have a new album coming out on August 27th. So pretty directly after the tour wraps up, we go right up into Canada and do some. This is Took's second album. Second album, yeah, exactly. It's called Never Enough. We have a song called Never Enough for You that we wrote for that album. So, so this is the first original song. First original song, yeah. So I mean, what started off as kind of a fun, you know, bunch of Canadian guys living in the states yeah. wanting to record and and sort of act as ambassadors to this great music that we grew up on um, has grown into a little more, you know. So, and then I have uh, the Kiss Cruise coming up with. Bruce Kulick band, which is myself and Brent Fitz again, Zach Throne, and then Bruce Kulick, who was in Kiss, obviously for like you know, 15 years or something during the non-makeup years. What would be the first thing you grab in a fire? My wife. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there was a time I would have said guitar, my yeah. guitar, obviously. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I guess family, uh, a dog. I don't have a dog, but I guess I would grab all that. After that. Then I'd be looking for the guitars. Yeah, yeah. like oh, I gotta get my guitar. Yeah, I, I saw you uh, ask this question on Facebook earlier today. Uh, if you had a time machine, uh, what personal exper uh, musical experience would you uh, go back and relive? Jeez, that's a good question. But you asked it, so I asked. It. Yeah, it, it's it's of course it's something that I don't really have to put much thought into myself when I ask these things. But um, you know, it's really interesting because uh, you know, we talk about like coming up with music, you know, in 2019 when so much has been done. So we can look at like Greta Van Fleet and go, oh, they're doing kind of a thing from back then. Um, it, to the point that, you know, in trying to come up with something original in this day and age is, is, is hard because so much has been done at this point. So sometimes I think to myself, it'd be really cool to go back, you know, because I'm the kind of guy when I'm listening to the radio and a Hendrix song comes on, I go, they try to go, okay, well, what would it be like if this was a brand new song and it was 1960, whatever, and this song came on the radio, what, what, what kind of impact would that have? Because it's different when you're having it so many years later, you know? Yeah. And you know how revolutionary these things must have sounded at the time. Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, all that stuff must have been the heaviest thing imaginable. And uh, that's probably what I would like to have been, you know, to go back to that particular era. It's easy to say, like, Woodstock or something like that, you know, like yeah. that, that particular moment where rock and roll became not just music, but became like a lifestyle, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, where that sort of almost famous kind of, um, uh, you know, where they, they, they call the girls groupies, but I think, you know, we still see it to this day, This this it's not so much about like, uh, you know, groupie mentality as it is people who are just in love with music and the power of music and the celebration of a live show. That's what's really interesting to me. So like we play in Europe, we play to the same front row almost the entire tour because the people travel and they follow and watch us and it's and after a while you kind of think to yourself aren't these people bored of this by this point like I mean seeing the same you know we changed up we, we change our show up just because of these people you know um, but it, it, it's always fascinating to me because I think to myself well if I was able to go follow my favorite band I wouldn't get sick of it either because it's so powerful the power of music well, you're, you know you're experiencing it right 
yeah. even as a fan, you yeah. experience yeah. absolutely yeah, yeah. as you're traveling and stuff. That's a yeah. Thing. So yeah, I mean, for me, it'd probably be go back to around 1968, 69 to that particular, like where it really became like. Like there was a point where the Stones and all those kind of bands would have been playing theaters and that kind of stuff, and then I think the Stones probably were the first to go. What if we took our own PA systems and started playing hockey arenas and stuff like that? Like the idea of actually touring in these larger venues was was not even uh, considered until that sort of thing. And I think that would have been an exciting time to be alive, to, to or to be young, to have been yeah. like able to kind of be transitioning from where rock and roll became really big and really a lifestyle to me you know because I think in in the earlier phase of rock and roll it was a lot more like is this even going to be a thing in 10 years you know the Beatles and the Stones is that just a, a phase? phase you know yeah. clearly not <laughs> they're still around you know? well, uh, wrapping things up mm -hmm. uh, anything else you would like to say or mention I'm always uh, you know it, 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 it's funny to consider here towards the end of this run when the end never really is the end, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, uh, it, it almost gets this bizarre cryptic feeling of like, you know, well, high five everybody, see you on the next run. And it's like, it never really ends, you know? It's yeah. like, that's the best thing about, things, you're always doing something. it's the most interesting thing about rock and roll. I think watching, you know, Axel and Slash on the same stage together makes you go, it never really ends, even though it ends. And it's very sort of like, this is never gonna happen again. It always kind of does, you know what I mean? And I think that's the exciting thing is, to me, it's almost when you sort of put a period at the end of the sentence, it's actually like just a dot, 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 you know what I mean? And I think that's the exciting thing about having a few things planned in the future, but also knowing that there's so much unspoken and you never know what the universe is going to present if you just kind of, once in a while I take, like to take my paddle out of the water and put it in the canoe and just see where the river takes me. And that's the exciting thing about 2020 for me right now is you never know. And that's the fun part for me. All right. Well, thanks for watching. We're here with Todd Kearns. Make sure to uh, visit uh, our YouTube channel and subscribe. And uh, yeah, and uh, buy some Damonware by Agent Royale. Yes. Thank you. Agent Royale.